Good morning, class. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, for some reason, things weren't working particularly well on the stream, so I had to reset the router and reset a few things, and seems like things are working okay now, so that's good! Excellent. Hello! Oh, I've got a kitten here who wants attention. And that was my cell phone. Oh my god. Blech! Oof. Alright. This is Rimby. I don't know if I've introduced Rimby to this class yet. But hello! You have to say hello because you're a kitten. Oh, as you kiss... Oh, look at that. But anyway, Rimby is a kitten. She is super, super into just being in my biz when I'm trying to do work. So, there you go. If you hear her meowing, then that's... Uh, you know, that's how that goes. Anywho, um, so, I, I made an announce, whoop, I put that in a separate, whoop, 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 whoop. um, my goodness, where is, there, meh. So I made an announcement about office hours. It occurred to me after I made the announcement that I actually have to, um, in order for the that idea to work, I would need to have all of you and all of the 1MD3 students in the same, like, Teams team. And I'm not sure that that's a amount of setup that I want to do. I think I'd rather just set a separate office hours time for you guys. So at some point, Today I'll put up a poll on Piazza, and you guys can vote on when you'd like an office hours slot designated for you. So, yeah. So, never mind this announcement. That's going to change. Um, yeah. <laughs> what breed is she? Um, I don't know. We got her from the SPCA, so I think she's at least partly Maine Coon. Um... Yeah, she's kind of like a medium hair mix, I guess you could say. But um, but yeah, so that's Rimby. She likes to she likes to bother me while I'm working, so she occasionally ends up in the stream. Um, there, I have another cat who is a big guy, and if I see him, I'll grab him for you. But yeah, so anyway. Um, office hours, we'll do a poll for that, see when people want to have office hours, and that'll be that. Cool. Um, neat. So, I guess, I guess, oh, that's for the other class. I'm sorry about that. I color coordinated so that I know the other class's blue slides and your class's red slides. That's why I can tell at a, at a glance without actually even having to read it. Anyway... So, <clears throat> very important to have the shawl with the collar set up properly. Anyway, so let's talk about technical stuff. We're going to talk about our lecture stuff. We were talking about arrays. Arrays in Python, or arrays in C are different in a number of fundamental ways from the types of data structures that you will have experienced so far in Python. Uh, in Python, a whole heck of a lot of the bookkeeping is done for you by Python itself. In C, almost nothing is done for you. Um, you have direct access to, the, uh, to memory manipulation. Uh, this is sort of a double-edged sword. If you have a very good understanding of how memory is used and manipulated in a computer, this means that you can write very efficient programs in C. Much You can write a much more efficient program in C than you could in something like Python that has all of this overhead. That uh, the, the, the catch is that you do have to understand how memory works. So an array is really just a pointer and accessing the different elements inside of an array, that's just syntactic sugar for um, pointer arithmetic. As we will see, our next uh, topic, topic number five, is going to be on the subject of pointers, so we can talk about what a pointer is and all of that. I know it's like, 
you've said the word pointer so many times, and we haven't even covered it yet, uh, but in a sense, we are scaffolding ourselves into the idea of covering pointers. So, yeah. Um, anyway. Haboop. Badoop. Yeah. So, let's talk about strings. Strings are character arrays. You may be used to Python not caring about the difference between a string and a, ca and a uh, character, but in C, there is a big O difference between uh, a string and, and, and a character. So, this is a meme. I made this meme. I hope you like my meme. Hello world. Hello world. Corporate needs to find you the dif f needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. GCC says that's the same picture. So, as it turns out, C handles strings as character arrays. Considering consider the following declarations: char foo is equal to bar. Foo will be written into memory as b a r null character. If we specify a size of 10, we get char foo 10 equals bar b a r null 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 character. So, oh, yeah. The um there are a couple of things to note about this. Number 1, the char data type is one byte in size. So each one of these is a byte in memory. The other thing to keep in mind about strings is that there is a null character at the end of them always in all cases. So this is a thing that you don't that you will not need that you pardon me this is a fact that is unnecessary for you to know if you're programming in Python. All of the strings that are in Python are also null terminated. They just do it automatically and don't, te don't worry you about it. They don't tell you about it. That's considered a superfluous detail that you don't need to know about. In C, we actually, because we are concerned not with uh, how Python uses a computer, but how the computer itself uses itself. The null characters are there so we can see them. Generally speaking, they are not printed. So, you know how a new line character shows up as, like, it's like you hit the enter key and a tab character is like you hit the tab key. A null character isn't necessary, like, it doesn't show up when you print the string but that doesn't mean it isn't there in memory. The null character, in terms of its encoding, the null character is just a bunch of zeros. It's like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's the null character, as you might expect. It's really important for a string to be terminated with a null character. It's like, well, if it's nothing, why do we need it, right? The reason that we terminate strings with null characters is so that we can tell when the end of the string is. This is, um, <laughs> as we're going to get into and as we're going to see, so to speak, in C, a an array, it, we don't check for the ending of an array. Like, you, as, as we talked about previously, you are the person who is responsible in C for making sure that you're not reading outside of the array. In other languages, if you try to read outside of the declared uh, bounds of an array, you'll end up with an out-of-bounds error or something like that. You know, an index error in Python. C doesn't have index errors. It'll just give you what you've asked for, regardless as to whether that makes sense or not. So if you try to read stuff that's outside the bounds of the array, it'll do it for you. You might get you'll you will get garbage data out of that, but C doesn't like 
the amount of checking that would be necessary at runtime to be able to do that is more than C considers to be necessary. So it just kind of throws you into the lake and expects you to learn how to sink or swim. Um, so in strings, if you have a null character at the end of the string, then a C program can look through the string, look uh, look for the end of the null character, and then or look for the null character at the end and say, okay, that's the stopping point. There's uh, the standard library. This is how the standard library functions for strings work. Uh, string standard libraries are contained in string.h. So if you want the like string concat um, or other similar um, functions, string copy, those are contained in string.h. Uh, I believe we're going to have, uh, I haven't, I can't, uh, again, this is kind of talking about slides I haven't written yet, but in the textbook there is a whole chapter on strings and string um, operations, and it seems to me that that is a thing that we are going to cover in some depth. So it's okay that this is like a sort of slap shot um, introduction to what a string is. We're trying to scaffold you into knowing how to deal with strings when we start dealing with them in earnest a little later on. So, yeah. So, string isn't even a keyword in C. I see I have a question. I will, I will grab that question now. Why would you do this instead of char foo equals bar? Does it have to be an array? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, char foo equals bar would come up with a syntax error because um, bar is not a char. It is larger, you're basically trying to assign something to 8 bytes that is larger than 8 bytes, and that, that would cause an error. Um, string operations like the ones in Python, uh, <laughs> like, in some sense, like, they are similar but distinct, let's say. Does the compiler just stop at the first null character in the second example, or will it read all seven of them? Um, well, first of all, we're not talking about the compiler. We're talking about the string libraries. And I'm not sure how they would behave under that circumstance, actually. Um, hmm. They would probably, yeah, they would probably stop at the first one. It's like this allocated memory would be unused. I believe that's how it would work. Uh, I would have to test it to be to be sure, though. So there you go. Da -da -da. Good questions, guys. Good questions. Yeah. So with respect to this declaration, you either have to have these square braces here to indicate that this is an array, or you have to have a star here to indicate that this is, is a character pointer, which is what it technically is, is it's a character pointer. Does there have to be a null character saved at the end? Would it be saved for um, char foo is equal to bar? Um, so, yeah, the, the, the null character has to be there. Um, that's why if you're... Like, the, the null character is implicit here, right? It's there, you just can't see it. You typed it without even realizing that you typed it. Um... Because we have left out the size here, um, C will automatically fit the array to the size of the literal that it's been given, including the null character. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to find space in memory for a string literal, I would recommend letting the compiler decide how much memory to to allocate to it. But yeah, um, if you were to allocate the memory manually, you would need to leave space for the null character. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully that's an answer to your question. So, string isn't even a keyword. Uh, character arrays may be indexed, indexed just like regular arrays. So, you, you can also do that in Python. If you want to get a particular character out of a string, you can just index it. Um, 
String literals are always terminated by the null character implicitly. So again, you type it without even realizing you're typing it. All strings must be null terminated. We can receive strings directly from scanf using the percent sign %f format specifier. Scanf, um, this number is a thing that's important as well. It percent sign some number s and then you give it the name of the uh, the string that you want to save it to. By inserting a number the format specifier may even be used to limit the number of characters that co get copied into the character array. This is super 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 important as we're gonna see in the next couple of slides. Foo is actually a pointer so we don't need the address of operator um, ampersand in scanf. Foo is already a memory address. So if you remember, if we wanted to read in a, an integer using scanf, we had to put the ampersand character in front of the variable name. The ampersand character is the address of operator, and the second argument of scanf takes a memory address to put the value into. Uh, because foo is already a pointer, you don't need to you don't need to uh, use the address of operator to get its address because it is already an address. Um, hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. I have a question. Boop. I I answered that question. So what would be saved for char? foo3 bar. Um, hmm. It might give you... Hmm, I don't know. Let's see. Burp. I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Um, so, um, let's say bar... 3 is equal to foo. Let's see if we can act, let's see if we can run that. If it gives us an error. And maybe we should print it as well. GCC W all arrays dot C. Hmm. Oh, there you go. Error. Wide character array initialized from non-wide string. There you go. So this is an error because you have not allocated enough space. Let's see if four works though. No, actually. Uh, okay. So I any number here at all is a uh, if you specify any number here, that's a syntax error. Or wait, wait, am I? Maybe not. Wait! Forget what I just said. Oh, it's because I'm doing... For God's sake. Oof! -da. All right. That's the error that I was seeing. Okay, so that actually works. So let's question ourselves. Let's see what does... What does bar actually produce? That'll be the last one. Foo. Okay. So the null character should be like, hmm. Well, it's not going to print the null character, obviously, but, you know. If you were to look at, um, interpret that as that and look at the that maybe we'll get something zero yeah that's a null character it's it's put it in it's just put it in outside the bounds of the array so this is this is the dangerous thing about c is that it's not going to check you right so this is still null terminated it's just that the null character is being saved outside the declared range of bar. 
this means that something might come in and overwrite it at some point because, you know, like, you have to be careful about your memory in C. But, yeah, this is uh, possible but not recommended, if that makes sense. Highly not recommended. I've got lots of questions. Does the specified index start at 0 or at 1? All indexes in C start at 0. Yeah, if the index starts at 0, that allows for four items anyway, right? Yes. So we're going to get into why this happens, but you can actually even ask for the... the uh, you can ask for the value after that one and probably get it. So let's see. Yeah, and it happens to contain a 22. So, this is, this is like, actually, this is a really good point. What we're illustrating here is that arrays are not considered fixed entities. Like, when you, when you look at a list in Python, you think of it as an object. You think it as a, of it as a self-contained little thing, right? Um, nothing interacts with it unless it's specifically told to do so. In C, you've got your memory, right? Uh, an array is just a pointer to some place in memory. All your indexing operation is, is it's arithmetic arithmetic on that pointer so you're just moving the pointer around the in the memory there's no actual restriction to make you stick to the declared size of that integer or not integer sorry the declared size of that array there's nothing that prevents you from reading outside of it and that can be extremely problematic uh, if you um if you don't know what you're doing yeah, well, we're we're interpreting it as a as an integer, right? So the question is, uh, bar four is twenty two, even though the rest of the elements are type char. Well, that's because we're reading it as an integer, right? If I read it as a character, then it would be a character as it showed up in the display. Like, you have to try to get beyond this idea that memory has an inherent type. Memory does not have an inherent type. All of the typing that Python does is layered on top of the memory. It's bookkeeping that Python does on top of the memory. The memory itself is just ones and zeros. It is just ones and zeros. And if you choose to interpret those ones and zeros as an integer, they'll show up as an integer. If you choose to interpret those ones and zeros as a character, it'll be a character. So there you go. So would ch uh, char foo two bar be a syntax error then? No. <laughs> I'll show you. Char two far. Uh, char two far. Boop boop boop. Words 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 speaking. Oh. Uh, warning. Initialize a string for array of chars is too long. Um. Yeah. So that one shows up as a warning, but uh, that's not. You know. <laughs> it probably still worked. If we uh, if we change this to three again, hopefully we get the null character again. Yeah, I think that's the null character. That's what it looks like. Let's see it as a um, negative three. Uh oh, we're getting random data. Okay, maybe it is dropping the null character. But um, yeah. Generally speaking, when you start going outside of the bounds of arrays, you're in you're in wild country. You're in no man's land. You can no longer guarantee that the things that you're putting into undeclared memory are going to stay the way that you set them. Uh, you can't you can't uh, assume they're going to have any particular value. That's why you need to be careful to stay inside of the um, of the memory that you've declared even though it's possible to not stick to that memory um and the uh, the next couple of slides are a perfect illustration of that so 
the question is, what's the 14 for? The 14 specifies that this is a string of 14 characters. Pardon me. No matter how long foo, uh, or sorry, as no matter how long the thing that's entered into the terminal is, scanf is on a, only going to take 14 characters and put that in foo. It's a way of limiting limiting the input to the size of the memory that you've declared for it. This is super important. Because overflow attacks. So a common form of security vulnerability in C and C++ programs is array overflow. So we've been talking about all of this business where, you know, if you're going outside the bounds of the array, you don't know what it is out there, right? You don't know how things are working. However, uh, just because we don't know that doesn't mean that some very, very clever hackers don't know that. So array bounds, arrays are replaced with pointer arithmetic by the compiler with no bounds checking. If you tell C to write 100 characters into a 50 character array, it will happily do so. The extra 50 characters will be written into memory that comes after the character array. This can overwrite all kinds of useful things like other variables. If the character array is stored in the stack, function call information can also be vulnerable. Hopefully your operating system is checking for this sort of thing, but that isn't necessarily the case. The moral of the story is that you should always limit the things you write into an array to the size of the array manually. Manually. Because C is not going to check it for you. What problems arise if the array has no null character? Probably the string, probably the string functions in string.h would uh, behave unpredictably. Because something like string copy is looking for the null character. If the null character is absent, again, possible but not recommended. Um, you may lose the ability to perform to to. Uh, you may lose the ability to use these string uh, string functions on the string and not know that you've lost that ability. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing about C. Um, you, If you're not careful, weird and wacky stuff can happen. Because, you know... Yeah, like... There are rules that you have to know, and if you don't follow the rules unpredictable things happen because the everybody's assuming everybody's following the rules. So ca strings are null terminated. If your string is not null terminated, it will it might crap out some of the some or even all of the functions in string.h and you may not even know that a problem has happened. Um, you might just get garbage output and have no idea why. So yeah. Uh, what if I want less than 14, as in I want to input only four characters? How would I stop scanf at four characters instead of 14? Um, super e easy peasy, shampoo squeezy. You just put a four here instead of a 14, and then that does exactly what you're describing. So this can be anything. I just used 14 as an example. I didn't want to put, like, X in there because I thought that might be more confusing. Um, yeah, anyway. So, smash that stack. Here's a program. Include stdio.h. Int main char query 10 characters. Printf, enter a query. Scanf. Notice that we are not specifying the number of characters here. Right? So if you don't specify the number of characters, you are taking all the characters. And it's going to be saved to query. Printf, the query is it the query is um this string new line character uh, and it, you know it's printing the query. So if we enter a query and it is longer than ten characters, we hit here, we actually print this longer string and then we get the error 
Stack smashing detected. Unknown terminated. Aborted core dumped. This is like, if you get an error like that, and you were not intending to, it's like, holy smokes, man. You need to look at your dang code. Because that, that is a serious frigging error right there. What this means is that I have over the and I can I can demonstrate this to you. This query is so large it has um so the 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 string here is being stored in stack memory, right? So the the string is being stored inside of the stack frame. It is so long that it has overwritten part of the next stack frame. That's a bad thing! That's like... To say that's a bad thing is a radical understatement. If this thing had gone on long enough, like, the, the process that it was interfering with um, was, like, probably just this program. Like, printf is uh, put on the stack uh, when it's... Um, when it's... Uh, when it's executed, but... Um, you can you can do serious damage to the current state of the operating system. You're probably not going to damage the operating system itself because it can always re reboot itself from permanent memory. But like this, this is big o problemo. Um, if you if you um, if you know how to do this correctly, you can basically do anything you want. To, to the program stack and other programs that are running on the system. It is it is serious frigging business. Um, so question, does that need to be hard-coded or can you use variables macros uh, which you can link to the array sizes? I believe that a, um, a variable wouldn't work for this situation. A variable, like, you can't just put a variable name into the middle of a string and have that interpreted. Like, this this has to be syntactically a couple of uh, a couple of numerical digits that are in your, in your source code directly. Now, because macros are actually performing string substitutions, right, um, when, when the preprocessor processes a macro, if you had a macro here, and that macro... Um, produced a couple of, um, well, I can actually just show you. Because it's a direct string substitution, it would work with a macro. So let's say we define size and call it 10, right? Is this the right program? That's the wrong program. Pardon me. Um, Pay no attention to that little man behind the curtain. So let me just let me just compile this and show you guys that that's reproducible. I didn't just pull that error out of my butt. I uh, actually I actually in, I, I caused that on my own machine. Um, there we go. And let's. I think that just put it in a dot out. Yeah. Enter a query. So oh, that's forty characters. Never mind. I want not as many of that because it's a lot of keyboard holding. So, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There we go. Ha! See? That just happened. So, it's reproducible. Um, <clears throat> what was I saying? Yeah, so macros. If we define a size macro of size 10, sure. I think you don't need a semicolon, but I forget. Wait, let me, that was in this set of slides, wasn't it? Do you need a semicolon? You don't need a semicolon. All right. Assuming I'm correct, which, you know, I don't know if you guys are like, confident in my abilities here, but, you know, maybe you shouldn't be. <laughs> so, if we put size in here, and we put size in here, 
I'm hoping that the macro preprocessor will pick this out and and process it, but I guess we're going to just see. Nope, it doesn't. Hmm. Seems like it needs to be hard-coded then. Hmm. Well, there you go. I don't know. It's possible that there's... It seems like it. there should be some mechanism for doing that, but um, it seems macros doesn't work. There you go. Very interesting. Um, hmm. So anyway, uh, yeah, hard code it for now. Until we figure out how to not have to hard code it, you got to hard code it. So, that's actually... Um, that's all we're going to say about uh, arrays and, like, the syntax of them and working with them uh, for this lecture. We are now going to move into a different... Um, we're going to talk about different stuff now for the rest of this, uh, this week. We're going to talk about some algorithms. Now that we have one-dimensional data structures, we should, um, we should develop some... Uh, stuff about how in which they be they would be used. Um, we're going to talk about sorting algorithms and searching algorithms. So question: the s in size was counted as the s of that. Yeah, I know, but like, the, the, I don't know. Maybe I'll I'll try. Okay, I'll try. You leaving a space? I don't think it'll work though. Yep, nothing. nothing. Okay. So, I have this very fun comic. We're going to talk about sorting algorithms. This comic will be funnier once we're done talking about sorting algorithms, but I put it up front anyway because, you know, whatever. <clears throat> These are cavemen. Who can explain frog sort algorithm? Start with empty list. For each integer, put that number of dead flies in one box, then put frog in each box. When frog leaves box, append box's fly number to list. More fly take longer to eat when all frogs gone from box list ordered. What is maximum step number? Log frog boxes. Very good. Now homework is program frog sort on home frog pewter. Later. Bah, be understand, but keep getting off by frog error. That's going to be more funny. Um, <clears throat> I have a question. Rename the macro to not size. Okay. I can try that. Not size. Not size. Not size. Nope, still nothing. It's a good it's a good thought though. Um maybe it was interfering because the first letter was S and that's a valid character. So, um Let's talk about the importance of sorting algorithms. Sorting algorithms are one of the oldest areas of algorithms research. Uh, the first formal analyses began in the 1950s, which, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is shortly after the invention of the computer itself in the modern sense. Um, many are necessary because there is no best algorithm. So the interesting thing about sorting algorithms is that many sort... First of all, there's like a buttload of them. And different sorting algorithms are better for different applications. Some are kind of universally bad, but there's no one best sorting algorithm. Uh, it really depends on the application. Different ones have different advantages. Um, different sorts perform better in different conditions. Um, how sorted the list is to begin with can have a big impact on some algorithms and no impact whatsoever on others, as we're going to see shortly. And whether you optimize for runtime, memory usage, or call stack usage is another consideration. Despite the venerable status of sorting algorithm research, advances are still being made. Even today, in an area of research that is 70 years old, we're still getting advances. For example, TimSort was, done, was invented, or published at least, in 2002. It is now Python's standard sorting algorithm. It uses ordered subsequences to improve performance. So if a portion, if a subsequence of your, uh, of your 
data structure is already sorted. It doesn't make any sense to resort it. You can just sort of copy it in. Library sort, it was, uh, it's the most recent one on Wikipedia, uh, 2006. It al allocates extra memory to gaps, which allows the insertion of entries without reorganization of the entire array. So if you think about how librarians sort books in a library, they don't fill the shelves completely a lot of the time. They'll leave space at the end of the shelf to be able to insert a book and not have to move a bunch of books over to the next shelf or down and up and up because it's that moving stuff around um, that constitutes, uh, in some cases, the majority of the actual work of sorting. So if you just leave some extra space, uh, you can you can insert without that penalty, and then you can compress that space at the end. Um, but yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So. So how is a sorting algorithm defined? A sorting algorithm is used to rearrange a given array or list of elements according to a comparison operator on the elements. The comparison operator is used to decide the new order of elements in their respective data structure. So, the input is an array of values of arbitrary size, and the output is an array of values in the same, of the same size in which the values are in ascending order. So, you've got an array, it's got numbers in it. If we sort the numbers, we get them from lowest to highest. That is a sorting algorithm. Very simple to define, uh, at least in comparison to some of the data structures that I think we're going to talk about a bit later on. So, the first and simplest sorting algorithm that we will talk about is Bubble sort. You may have actually even heard of bubble sort before. Um, bubble sort is a basic, basic, basic algorithm, and its performance characteristics are not fantastic, but it's easy to understand and a good place to start. So, bubble sort's basic operation is to examine two numbers and swap them if they are in the wrong order. It starts at the beginning of the array and examines each pair of consecutive elements in the order that they occur. After one pass through the array, the item at the end of the array is guaranteed to be in the right place, so the next pass can safely ignore it. So um, we're going to see an example of this on the next slide. Bubble sort will make n minus 1 passes for a, an array of size n. By the end of the n minus 1th pass, the whole array is guaranteed to be sorted. So. This is what bubble sort looks like. I'm going to blow it up a little bit for you guys there. There, that should be a little better. So, if we have this array, 9471736, the numbers that are highlighted here in light blue, this you can consider this to be the examination frame of the algorithm. The algorithm will only examine two numbers at once, and make a decision based on its examination of those two numbers. So the first two numbers it examines are the first two numbers in the array. If they are in the wrong order, it swaps them. So you notice 9 and 4 are in the wrong order, so it swaps them to 4 and 9. It then moves the examination frame over by 1, so it's now looking at 9 and 7. Those are in the wrong order, so it swaps. Then it moves to 9, 1 swaps those, 9, 7, swaps those, 9, 3, swaps those, 9, 6, swaps those. So in this particular array, we were in the unfortunate position of having the largest number be the first element. So it had to be moved all the way through to the end of the uh, array. And you can see that took 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 swapping operations. But... Once we have completed the first pass, nine is gar like whatever ended up here is guaranteed to be correct. Uh, so we can safely ignore that on 
further passes. You'll notice we don't need this step here where we're uh, where we're examining the last two elements because, you know, the last element is guaranteed to be in the right spot. So we look at 4, 7. Uh, that one's in the correct order, so we don't do anything. 7, 1, swap it. 7, 7, that's fine. 7, 3, swap that. 7, 6, swap that. 7 is guaranteed to be in the right place. We then look at 4, 1, swap that. 4, 7, that's correct. 7, 3, that needs to be swapped. 7, 6, swap that. We now have three numbers that are guaranteed to be correct. We then look at 1, 4, that's correct. 4, 3, swap those. Those of you who are astute will notice that this is actually the last swap that needs to be performed on the array. Um, however, the bubble sort algorithm is going to still run through all of its checks. So, it checks that one, this one's guaranteed, there, 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 and then finally, after all of these checks, our, 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 al uh, our algorithm is guaranteed to have sorted the entire array. Um, it's not, hopefully this isn't uh, too bad for you guys to understand conceptually. So, yeah, that's bubble sort. The reason they call it bubble sort is because the big numbers kind of bubble up through the array. So if you were to graph the progress of these items through the various iterations of the array, you'll notice that it looks like the um, it looks like the lower numbers are bubbling up. So there you go. So I'll just um, oop. Uh, but the, but the, I'll just do the next slide and then we'll call it a day for today. So, analyzing our algorithm. The number of swap operations we required in the previous example was 13. The total number of examinations was 21 for an array of size 7. For each additional element in the array, we have to add n minus 1 to the total number of examinations. This means that the total number of operations is proportional to the square of the size of the array. We say that the complexity of this algorithm is big O n squared. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, topic that we're going to cover tomorrow is going to be big O notation, so don't worry about it too much yet. Bubble sort can't tell if the number of swaps that are needed... Um, bu sorry, bubble sort can't tell the number of swaps that are needed before it makes a pass. Like, if it already knew how many swaps would be needed, it could just perform those swaps, and it wouldn't need to iterate through them. The same number of examinations will occur regarded, uh, regardless of the orderedness of the array, so it doesn't matter what state the array is in, bubble sort will always take the same amount of time to go through the whole thing. Uh, because uh, this means that it's a non-adaptive algorithm, that's the term. You've got adaptive ones and non-adaptive ones, and this is a non-adaptive algorithm. We say that the best case runtime is equal to the worst case runtime because it doesn't care, like because it doesn't care, it doesn't matter how sorted the algorithm the the it doesn't matter how sorted the array is co going into the algorithm. Bubble sort is always going to perform the same number of operations, so. There's no such thing as a best or a worst case in this in this scenario, um, but yeah. So that's that's bubble sort. Um, it's it's so basic that if it were a, a playing D and D, its character would be a human fighter. Um, anyway, I think that's about as much damage as we can do for today. Um, I'll stay on a, a couple of minutes extra to take any questions that you might have but uh i think that's it thank you guys for listening to this this person talking anyway
Well, doesn't seem like anybody has any questions, so I'm going to sign off here. Thank you very much, folks. Um, see you tomorrow.